Brian McKnight, how you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Lost you some kind of way. Okay. Yeah, no, no problem. 17-time Grammy-nominated artist. I want to salute you for your 30 years and 20 albums. It's a real accomplishment. Thank you for your contributions, not only to R&B, but to music as a whole. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No doubt. Now, why now? Why is this your last album, Brian? You know, the, I've been doing the same thing the same way probably since I was 18. And I'm 51. And I thought that in 2020, releasing my 20th album and looking at what the future is going to be for myself and for my wife and how we want to live our lives, I think I just want to scale back a little bit. I'm not retiring. I'm still going to do shows. I'm still going to do a lot of the other things that I've done. I'm just not releasing another album of original music because I don't know. I think I want to wake up and not have to worry about whether a song that I've written has to be on a chart, whether I have to do you know, a lot of the things that I've always done, I want to just wake up every day and do whatever makes us happy. Mm-hmm. You know, pretty much every minute for the rest of our lives. I think that I want to know what it's like to be that free. I think that I've, I think that I've said everything I, I've wanted to say, you know? Yeah. I think that's where I am right now. Not too many artists release 20 albums in their career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great and timeless ones at that. My favorite Thank album from you is Back at One. That's just, I mean, Shall We Begin? I can go on and on of the songs on that album. Yeah, it was, he, listen, uh, no one's ever going to dispute that Back at One is my, my biggest selling one, probably the most popular one. Um, but that's, that album doesn't mean anything to me on an emotional side because it, I hadn't, I was still just writing from imagination. I never truly believed in love or believed that love really existed until I met my wife eight years ago. So in as much as those records were financially important for me, you know, these last three are the ones that mean the most because they actually have a subject. Every song I've written since I met Leilani has been about her and about our life. And it's the meat of who I am. Who I am is in these last three albums and, that's why it's, it's easy to walk away because, you know, I've, I've said it all. I've, I've given everything I've got to, to the music that I've written, particularly these last three. And um, it's just always funny to me that, that I kind of fooled everybody, <laughs> even though I've always said this. You know, when people ask me how I wrote back at one this incredibly romantic song, I'm like, well, from the manual of a DVD, DVD player. <laughs> That's true. I was just sitting there reading, and I was like, oh, it's quite an interesting concept for a song. So... Um, it's been quite a journey, for sure. It has been, and we all salute you and thank you for that. Looking back on all your albums, which one do you think is your best one? Whew. Well, most successful will be back at one. I think my best album is a combination of Genesis, which is my last album, and Exodus. Well, actually, these last three better. <laughs> Genesis and Exodus, is, I think, is the best work I've ever done by far. Mm-hmm. What do you feel you contributed to music as a whole, not just R&B, that other artists didn't? Well, that's an interesting question, because I never, I never set out to make any one kind of music. I'm a songwriter. I, just, I wrote songs. And when people decided to create genres, um, they put those songs into whatever genre they thought it fit the best. Um... I'm not sure if I can answer that. I think I'd have to leave that answer up to the people who have enjoyed the music as to what that is. I think that once I wrote it, um, it was really up to those people to take it and make it their own in some kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, I never really thought of what I was doing that it was going to to make something or do something or be something. Um, I just wrote, and then whatever happens, happens. Mm-hmm. What's the significance of the title Exodus for people who may not know? Well, <clears throat> considering that the last record was Genesis, what I wanted to do was to go back and revisit all the musical styles that I had incorporated on all the records and put them into one. For Exodus, more than anything, it's just about this is it. Um, it's, it's the perfect bookend to um, my very first album. Brian McKnight was... was the album that I made when I was 19. 
And now Exodus is the album that I released when I was 51. So, you know, it's the beginning and the end. This one's the end. One Last Cry. I was off your first album. Right. It's a great song and timeless hit. I want to ask you about this an interesting question. Is your performance with Drake at the 2014 ESPYs, what was that like? <laughs> well, you know, at the time, you know, we're talking about one of the biggest artists in the world. He could have asked anyone to do that with him. And to get that call, I mean, really, it was the day before. We barely rehearsed it, um, knowing that it was a comedy sketch made it even that much more fun. <laughs> and uh, at the ESPYs, which is, you know, the biggest sport award show and probably in the world. Yeah. Um, it's not every day that you get to be on a show like that if you're not an athlete. So it was really fun to, to do that and do that with him as well. Side pieces. That was the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if anybody in the audience thought it was. <laughs> I, mean, I saw a lot of uncomfortable faces out there, but it was definitely funny. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's a timeless performance. I remember it. I, I watched it live, and I was like, oh, wow, he brought Brian McKnight out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think people were you expecting need an exclamation it. Point. No, they weren't expecting that at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Another sports topic I definitely want to cover right now is the song that you made with Kobe Bryant, Hold Me. What was that like, making that track right. with him? <clears throat> you know, it was fun. Uh, I think at the time, uh, I believe that, that Kobe could have done anything he wanted to do. And I think that's always been the case. I think he was super talented on so many levels. And the guy, you know, can speak several languages. He's really, you know, really, really smart. He's obviously one of the best basketball players that ever lived. Um, it was just unfortunate that right at the time when he was about to launch a rap career, the Lakers won three championships in a row. And I think he had to start focusing <laughs> completely on his basketball career and to maybe not, I think maybe he even thought he would be able to come back and revisit it. But I think that it was it was interesting timing as to when he was going to release his rap album in his career. That you know that's when everything took off for him. So we'll never know yeah. how great Kobe Bryant could have been as a rapper because he became you know a basketball god at that moment. Yeah, and rest in peace to him. That was a tragic incident that happened back in, earlier in the year. And something yeah, that I wanted yeah, to, yeah, it's it was definitely just very depressing when that happened. How are you maintaining during the whole coronavirus, especially with performances? I know you go on Instagram and you play the guitar, perform some songs. Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's unprecedented the times that we're living in right now. No one could have foreseen that anything like the coronavirus would have happened. And I think that we're all coping with it as best we can. I think for my wife and I, you know, we spend every second together anyway, and now we're getting to do it at home, which we very rarely get to do. Um, but as far as work goes, you know, it, it's halted. I mean, if it halted sports, can you imagine what it's done to concerts and to concert venues and to hear about, you know, a lot of venues that are going out of business and, you know, it's very uncertain as to how the bulk of our industry, as far as artists are concerned, moving forward as far as doing shows, who knows when that's ever, if, if and when that will ever happen again. Um, it's it's, it's going to be very interesting these next six months, like the last six months, moving forward, and when, when or if that will ever happen again. So we'll see. But, you know, we're doing fine here. You know, we, we wake up every morning and we... We have a, a blank itinerary and we fill it up with whatever we want. And that's, you know, partly kind of like the pseudo retirement that I'm talking about. It's been really great for us to just, you know, live our lives however we want. And uh, we'd like a lot, we'd like some more of that. So that's what we're going to do. Hopefully we can get back out there soon and this, they find a cure for this. So you could even do performances for this last album. I know your fans will go wild for this. Because this is your final album. Yeah, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing, to singing some of these new songs that I haven't been able to do yet. So, yeah, hopefully that happens soon. How do you feel about the current state of R&B today and how it's changed from when you started? You know, I get this question a lot. This is what I would say. When I think of R&B music, I don't think about 
even the music that we made in the 90s. I think that we did, we, when I think of R&B music, I'm thinking of the OJ, and the Temptations, and James Brown, and, you know, Marvin Gaye and Stevie from back in the day. I don't think that any of us that have made music since then would think that what we did is anything like what they did. And I think that what we've done is done a disservice not only to them, but to every music that's come after that by not naming it something else. Uh, new R&B or something else, some other name, so that everything can stand on its own. So when we listen to the music of today, these kids that are making music are making their music. I don't think it's R&B. I don't think there is a current state of it, because I think the current state of R&B, uh, the people who are still making the kind of, if, 90s, if it's 90s R&B, there's still lots of people out there making great 90s R&B. Mm -hmm. And these kids who are making it now are making their music in a, in a way that is being digested by the people that like it in such a great volume or number that we can't dispute that one at all. Now, we can all sit back and be, be the old head saying, man, that music's not like this. Is, but it's like, I'm not going to be that guy that says that. I, I love what If you're creating something, I love it. You know, I'm just not going to sit here and say that it's R&B. I'm not going to say that it's pop music or that it's rock or that it's whatever. It's just whatever you're making. I think every, every music is going to evolve. The music that I loved as a kid, my parents didn't like at all. They wouldn't listen to it. <laughs> but, you know, I think that that's it's a generational thing. So I might have to offer everybody, look, if you make something and you're putting it out there for people to criticize, who am I? You've got to say that it's not good or that it's not anything. I, I think I, my hat's off to you. Because it's hard. It's hard to create something or make something and then put it out for people to tell you that it stinks or to tell you that they love it. But you don't know what response you're going to get. And I think uh, I think it's great no matter who you are, no matter what it sounds like, no matter what genre they get. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I do. Especially, you know, people put their heart and soul into their music, especially with this new album, you could tell you put your blood, sweat, and tears into this Exodus album. How long did you did it take yeah. for you to put this together? I think from the first song I wrote to the last one, probably about seven or eight months. Not mm -hmm. every day back to back because I don't I don't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> but in time, from the time I wrote the first one to the time I wrote Nobody, which is probably the last song that I wrote to this, probably about seven months. You made your wife a big part of this album. What does she feel about the album? Well, my wife <laughs> has heard and been in the room with me when I've written every one of those songs. And I, from what she told me and, you know, from from the day that we met and all the songs that I've written, that it's, it's hard for her to believe that all of this is, you know, it's, it's, we live a fairy tale. If you look at our Instagram that's just a small piece of what our life is actually like. And she's my princess. She's my queen. And everything that I do is for her and about her. And when she hears the songs, if, if she hears that lyric that's about her, you know, I can't, you know, I'm sure she, you know, she said to me that, you know, it's wild. Because I asked her all the time, like, what? we're listening to the album in the car. I'm like, what's it, how's it feel to know that these lyrics are about you and she turns to me and she's got tears in her eyes and she's like how do you think you know look at me I'm you know <laughs> I'm, I'm a mess because because when I'm showing that much love to her which I do believe me she's shining that mirror of her love for me right back on me and we both when we watch the Nobody video you can't help but tear up because that's that's our wedding that, that was the, the happiest day of, of both of our lives is exactly the way we always that it would be, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we are living the fairy tale. We're living that dream that that we have realized through DMs and through responses from people that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants this idea of complete and total devotion, complete and total being in love. You hear people say, "I love you" all the time. How often do people hear people actually say that I'm in love with the person that they're with? You never hear. But Very that's rarely. All we do. That's what we read. We, that's what we do every day. You'll never hear us say, I love you. But that's, we're in love. And I, obviously, you have to love somebody to be in love, but ours is so much deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can remember, you know, my, my buddy loving his dog. He loves his dog. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't in love with his dog, is what I'm trying to say. 
I'm not saying it very well, but you, you understand what I'm saying. That we are, we're in love, yeah. and it's in the show. It's not. It's not on the surface. It's not. It's deep. It's you know my. She is my heart, and I am hers. Mm-hmm. And that's important, and that visual nobody is available on YouTube for people to check out. One last question for you, Brian McKnight, before I let you go. What would you say is your most memorable moment of your entire 30-year career in the music industry? Yeah, see, that's, that's a tough one because... There's a lot of them. The memorable moments that I have... Yeah, well, it's not that there's a lot of them. The memorable moments I have <clears throat> don't really have anything to do with the music itself. You know, my wife has a tattoo that I wrote. Um in my handwriting on her arm of a lyric that I wrote, the very first song that I wrote for, called No One's Gonna Love You Like I Do. And I think that's my favorite moment, that a lyric that actually meant something to me for the first time in my life is now immortalized on her arm. And then it's that moment. And then all the moments that came after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no award can, can, can compete with that. No platinum record can compete with that. No, can't beat that. Brian McKnight, I want to thank you for calling my show today to discuss your album and your 30-year career, 20 albums. I don't think there's anyone that's done it like you and the way you've done it. We'll always listen to your music. It's timeless, and I want to thank you and give you a round of applause for calling the show today, WSJ Radio, <laughs> St. John's University. Brian McKnight, I want you to take care and stay safe during these times. I will continue to play your music until my end of time. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. No doubt. Take care. Thank you to everyone who tuned in right now live for the interview with Brian McKnight. R&B legend. Salute to him. 17-time Grammy-nominated artist. Some of the greatest R&B you'll ever hear. To name a few, anytime, back at one, I remember you. His first album, Brian McKnight, self-titled, of course. Exodus is available on all platforms. Just dropped. June 26th on all platforms. Make sure you go check it out. Download it. Salute to the legend and what he's done for the game. Follow him on Instagram at BrianMcKnight23. Follow him on Twitter at It's B McKnight. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at TheRealMax, T-H-E-R-E-E-L-M-A-X. You know what it is. Stay tuned. Stay safe. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. See you later.